Good to have you here this morning. How is everyone today? Some of you are good. Happy Father's Day. We, can, we have an excuse to celebrate, an excuse. How many of you got trapped by traffic from the marathon? Any of you? Yeah, I hear that was amazing. It's nice to have construction on Pemina because that means no marathon on Father's Day. So how many of you have ever participated or, I mean, run in any part of the marathon? Any of you ever done it? Okay. Good. We have partners for next year to do the, uh, the relay race. DM, we're in for the relay race? Yeah? Because Aya, you had your hand up? You do the relay race? We can have a little team? Like, good night. That, oh. All right, relay race it is. I have done it a couple of times, and uh, it is a great delight, and I need a reason to run, because I don't particularly like running. So if you have a race coming, then it's worth it. So things are wrapping up for the season uh, here at the church. They're not coming to a close, but they're wrapping up a little bit. So I have uh, several of announcements, some really exciting announcements for you, and then I'll get into Romans. Uh, Romans. Wow, we're not in that book. Hebrews, maybe that was prophetic. We're gonna get into Romans next. No, we're doing the book of Mark next. But Hebrews chapter 12, we'll get to that right away. But uh, so just so that you're aware as a church, like things are now coming down and we're like, some people are like, oh, I wish you would just go through summer. Yeah, we would love to, but like actually as staff, like we actually need a breath sometimes. And it's like full speed all the time. And we try to take a few days and a few days, but you never... Uh, unwind. So we go from this into camp, and then August, we're trying to be as like almost zero as possible. We'll have church and do it, but here's the great opportunity. You can connect with each other, or you can do things. If you want to still come to the church on Friday and pray, you can. Just ask, and I'll make sure that the door is open. You can do that for sure, uh, but we're going to try to take a, a breath over summer, and then in fall, we'll kick into high gear. We have journey one and journey two going to be firing up again. And our prayer nights are going to go on. So this coming week is our last uh, prayer night, Friday night. So if you have not come for prophetic ministry and you would like to, Friday night here at the church, we have soup in the prayer room open from 4 p.m. till 9 p.m. But if you would like to come and have people listen to God and see if he would have a word from you from 7.30 to 9, and this Friday is our last time doing that. So come for soup, bread, hang out, pray, and then prophetic. So if you'd like that, we'd love to have you come. Camp is a couple weeks away. It starts up, staff camp, and middle school, high school is like pretty packed, kids like full. But we have some really good news. And the good news is like we have more than enough staff for camp. Now, I say that's good news because the majority of camps are really struggling post-COVID to fill camps and to find staff for camps. And part of the reason I think that it's, it's been working for us is because it's part of a vision that we have here at the church as a whole. It's not camp is not a separate idea that's going on. And I think now what's going on, the conversation with a lot of camps is like, how do we actually partner and help churches fulfill their vision? And I think that's a really, really good thing. That's how camps began. Some churches were like, we need to get out of the city so that we don't have just all of the the pressures and demands and get into God's creation. So I think it's really wonderful. Uh, July 21st to 23rd, we do have baptism on that 23rd. No service here at the church. We're going to do it at St. Malo at Lakeshore Bible Camp. So if you would like to get baptized, you can come and join us there. We would love to to have you. There's information online, so you can always uh, sign up there or let me know that you'd like to get baptized, and we'd love to have that have you there. You'll also notice a chair that's in the lobby that is made of, like, I think willow, but a chair that's out there that Woodworking Walt has made. He did one last year, did it this year. There's a little draw, 100% of the proceeds go to camp. This is the way that he got to contribute. Hundreds of dollars worth of um, tickets have been bought for it. So I think it's, I wrote it down, not think. Two bucks for one ticket, five bucks for three. And again, all the proceeds help people to go to camp. And then we do a draw at the end. So I think Harriet won the draw last year. You get this stunning chair. Uh, Walt and I are gonna go searching for next year's chair wood. Uh, So we're going to do that in the next couple of weeks, which is great. So, uh, oh, and the last one is Alto's Family Restaurant. Every Friday for the last six weeks, we've been going to Alto's at 9 a.m. I know some of you are like, what? I work. But some of you like, don't work at 9 a.m. on Friday mornings. Or you're of the age where Filmin' Fridays is still a thing. Do any of you remember Filmin' Fridays? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Anyone over 45? So not quite, but if nine o'clock, if you are free and you want to join us, this Friday is the last Friday that we're going to do it. Alto's, we don't go there because the breakfast is awesome. 
to go there because the breakfast is cheaper <laughs> and there's lots of space. So if you'd like to join us in our free, maybe you want to take a morning off and come and hang out and we have as much space as we would like. So we'll have that together. I don't buy everyone's breakfast, but you can buy your own because it's so cheap. Okay. Now I have two last announcements for you. These ones are, are really fun and I've waited a long time to share these two announcements. So for many, many years, I've been praying about a particular item for our church. Curiosity. Um, we've been praying about something. This last fall, it felt like God was saying, Donovan, now it's time. The church needs one now. Now you need to go and find this item. I'm trying to be very ambiguous. You need to find this particular item. I'm like, oh man, God, like where in the world? A friend of mine's name came to mind. I phoned him up. I was like, listen. Darcy, we need this. I can't buy it, but I need you to help me to get one. Can you help me to get one? He's like, do you really need it? Let's do breakfast. We talked about why I thought we needed this particular item. He's like, okay, I'm on it. I'm gonna see if I can find something and see if I can pull something together. It wasn't a few days. He's like, I think I have an option. I think there's something that's going on. I think uh, that this might be an option. Anyway, okay, so. Any of you know yet what we got? Some of you do, because ah, there's a few of you that I've leaked because I can't keep anything to myself. Um, it's a problem. So anyway, I want to show you what we are getting on July the 21st. Come on now. So there is a, that's a coach, by the way. Like you need an air brakes license to drive this thing. And you can put all the stuff on the bottom. This will be great for camp in the coming years. But there's a, a group of churches in Niverville that has had a bus for like decades. And they use it for the school, for the community, for churches. Lots of people use it. They wanted a, a cheaper option, but a way to help the community and help churches work together and bring together. And this is something we love. Anyway, so my friend Darcy connected us with this church, this group of people who... We're in the process of wondering if they were supposed to find another place to donate the bus to carry on the vision of the, of the bus ministry. And uh, so in dialogues back and forth, they made a unanimous decision as a, a board and as a group of churches that they wanted to entrust the ministry of the bus to Anchor Point Church starting this July. So, yeah. So that'll be used for all sorts of stuff, like... The hiking crew will get going again, right, Aaron? Yeah, okay, good. So hiking, the school, we, we like, really desperately want to have it there with us going together to go to camp, for family camp. There's a variety of things that we would like and we can see the bus to be used for. I have two questions or two things for you to consider. One, if any of you has a class one or two with air brakes, I may have some volunteer opportunities for you or some paid opportunities for you as well, depending on what that looks like. So... Right now, there's a couple of us, uh, TJ and I for sure, have a class one with air. So uh, we'll lure you in, TJ, and you won't really have an option. Oh, no, you're in. All right, perfect. So we are going to need that. Obram, you have a, a class one? Woo! I heard that there was a song the summer of 63, I thought, but 83 might be the way that this song needs to go. So, okay, so Obram and I and TJ, we, got, we just tripled our amount of drivers overnight. So that's one. And the second one is, we, we have some options on where to park the bus. And like Church of the Rock has said, Donovan, you can come park it there. But like mischief is pretty bad in the city these days. And it's like no matter where you park it, things get broken into. And we have full video of people that have stolen stuff, broken into stuff, clipped wires from our church. We have full video. And they, they just can't really do much about it because there's so much of it. So we are looking for a place that's in the city so that we don't have to drive way out to the country, which it's safer, looking for a place that has, there's a compound, something that's enclosed where it would be safe, preferably free, uh, looking for a place that there would be. So if you know someone or are someone who has a place like this that might be available, we would love to talk. And I'm offering that Abe will drive you for free uh, in the bus with your business if it's your business is the one that does it. Abe and I together, we'll be, make it the party bus. And we'll make sure that you guys have a really good time and that will be the payment for you if we can park there. So, okay, got that? That's a good announcement, right? Okay, so, and again, if you have like plans or a way that you want to draw the community together or bring a bunch of people from the church together, um, more than happy to see if we can help make that, uh, accomplish that and make that work. 
Second big announcement, this one I've talked about and dreamt about and teased about for a long time. And so I'm pleased to announce that there's a website that has now been put together. It's official. Uh, friends of ours from Uncharted Adventures is, is hosting a trip, an anchor point trip to Israel in October of 2024. So you have like 17, 18 months if you would like to join us on this trip. Um, you will see the prices in US dollars. Again, we had a really challenging time to like make it reasonable in price, but also like a trip of a lifetime to go away and be somewhere like the Holy Land and to explore that. So we tried to get in as much as we could and adventure. There's a 10 day and a 14 day trip. The 10-day trip is like, everyone can come. The 14 days, the last three days of, that, of the extended trip is like going into, a, into the desert, the Negev desert, sleeping with under the stars in a Bedouin village in tents, going out and cliff jumping and rappelling into an oasis that's out in the desert in the hills. Not really a big deal. <laughs> and so... These are all of it. You can go on the website to look at it. Flights are not included in the price because some of you may have points. You might want to use it another way that way. You may want to go a few days early. You may want to travel back and, and have a few stops on the way back. So they have a place that you can sign up for that if you want them to help book you flights. There is some time. There's a limited number. We could take 52, I think, officially on the trip. Um, and there's room to expand that. Uh, if there's enough interest, we could expand it, but that's sort of our limiter right now. And we've made it for Anchor Point, and there is possibly room for, like, if you have a close friend or family member that it's, like, the right trip uh, to come along, like, gladly. We're just not opening it up to say, hey, the whole world, come and join us, because we really kind of want to do, like, church family. And we know that this isn't going to be, like, not everyone can afford it. I, I totally understand it. And this is not a, if you are in at Anchor Point, you have to afford it. No, no, no. But if it's something that you've wanted to do and you have some money that's saved up for it, we wanted to provide a way that we could all go and explore Israel together. Sound good? And you can go look. All the itinerary, everything that we're going to do out there, the whole trip is mapped out and you can go and enjoy your time and come join me in Israel. All right. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> You're like, sweet. So both of you will come. Abby and I will both be there. Okay. <laughs> Abby and I are signed up, ready to go. So there's two. So anyway, happy Father's Day. And we're going to get into our second last chapter of the book of Hebrews. Uh, those of you who are here last week, did Terrily not do a fantastic job? Yeah. So this is what I said to the first service. Like, if you think she should preach again, it took seven years to get her to preach. She did so good. You should, like, send her a message and be like, God told me that you should preach more. <laughs> Did that come across appropriately, Joel? <laughs> you laughed, so that was exactly what I wanted. Anyway, so I won't be able to get through everything in Hebrews 12. Like every chapter, we can't get through it all. But we want to get through enough, try to take the path that God would have us go through to inspire you, to encourage you, to challenge you so that you will open up the Word of God and dig into it further. So Hebrews chapter 12, let me start off with prayer and then we'll jump in and See how far we make it. God, thank you for today. What a gift to gather as people who are hungry to know you. God, would you open our hearts, Jesus? Would you cause us to like hunger for you, the King? Would you cause us to have our eyes set on you? God, would, would we, as we're looking into your word today, would you challenge us or encourage us or help us to see the value of following your word, following the commands that you've written for us? God, would you teach us to love you more? God, today I, I want to pray about these things. I pray about camp. God, I pray that many would come and encounter you, the living King. God, that there would be transformation in the lives of our youth and our leaders that are going to be there. God, that this would be a place that as we get away from the city, we'd find peace with you. God, in the way that you created us in the world. God, I think about the opportunity of this bus. God, I pray a blessing upon Roger Armbruster and the whole crew out in Neverville, God, who would hear from you and decide this is the place to entrust the bus. God, would we be faithful with it? But God, would you bless them? God, for being so kingdom-minded, they say, yeah, we're not, we're not being stewards the way that we need to any longer. Like, maybe there's something else and they would just do this. God, that is an amazing example. 
God, would we be a church that follows and lives out that example as well? God, thank you for this time we have together. Thank you that we can even consider, that some of us can consider traveling around the world to see the place and walk where you walked, God. That's a gift that 100 years ago was no option. And today, God, it's, it's an option for some of us to do that. And I'm, I'm so grateful. Uh, God, I pray that the word of God would be really alive and active for us as well. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for people that are here that are guests and those that are making this their home and those that have been here for years. God, would, would we be just one family in pursuit of you? God, we're one part of the family of God within this city, God, within this country, and I give you praise. Spirit, come and rest upon the churches. God, your bride, teach us and remind us and reveal to us, Jesus, your good news. In your name we pray, amen. So Hebrews chapter 11, we have to start at the end of Hebrews 11 in order for us to understand chapter 12. So Hebrews 11, Terry Lee was going through most or many of the names in chapter 11. And these are Old Testament saints. And they weren't saints because they were perfect. They were saints because at the end of their life, they had submitted themselves to God. And they are written in the chapter that we call the faith chapter. We, on the other hand, so the the Old Testament saints, or chapter 11, these are all people in the, in the older covenant, in the Old Testament. These are all those pre the death of Christ. And then we have us, the Hebrews that he's writing to and to those believers afterwards. We come at a time after the death and resurrection of Christ. And so we have this mix, and in the middle is Jesus, and the author of Hebrews all the way through is just highlighting Jesus over and over. And again, today we will highlight Jesus again, but... I'm not going to focus all of my attention on there, but it will be somewhat in that, in that vein. We are living in the new hope, the new covenant. We have this beautiful picture that we can look at. We can look back at the, these Hebrew saints who did not have Jesus at the time. They, they have this. And we can look all the way through to the Hebrews. They came through the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, the Holy Spirit coming upon the church. And again, Hebrews 11, these ones over here, they were counted as faithful because they had submitted or surrendered themselves to God by the end of their lives. And this is what the Lord would require or desire for us is to have our lives surrendered to him. So at the end of chapter 11, verse 39 and 40, it says this. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect? Only together with us would they be made perfect. And what is the link between them being perfect and us? What's the link? Comes back in the middle. Jesus. You can say it. Uh, what's the joining factor? Jesus. Yeah, we better try again. What's the joining factor? Jesus. Ah, we're going to come back to that. That will be the answer every time I ask you, except when it's not. Okay. <laughs> so they were waiting for a savior. They weren't saved by the law. The sacrifices didn't work for them. It was a picture of what was to come, a shadow we learned earlier in Hebrews of what's to come. And the real deal was still Jesus. He was the one that they needed. They were waiting for a savior. But this wasn't an accident. God from the beginning planned something better for us. He planned something that would be better. The Old Testament saints, the New Testament followers of Jesus, there was something better for us that would make us Perfect. What makes us perfect? You got this. When we receive Jesus into our lives, we become perfected. We can stand before God because his blood covers us, and this is the gospel or the good news. And the hope that we have is to spend eternity in heaven with... Uh, I, had to, I had to really work on that to get to Jesus. So we all need Jesus. Pre-cross, post-cross, his death was final once and for... Ah, Jesus. You got it. Once and for Jesus, once and for all, through Jesus. And this was what he would have for us. So what is the hope that the Jews had before Christ? Well, they had the hope that a Savior was coming, but they, they didn't maybe know what this looked like. They just knew there was someone coming to rescue them. They got the idea wrong, but uh, often they got it wrong. But there was prophetic words that they were clinging on to that would tell them of what's to come. And so Daniel is one of the places I'm going to look today. But Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. 
And this is one of the prophetic words. Daniel was a prophet. It says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Okay, so they are now talking about multitudes. They're going to be asleep in the dust of the earth, but they will awaken. They will come alive. Some to everlasting life. Others to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay, so the Jewish people, pre-Jesus, they're waiting for this hope to be fulfilled. They're like, oh, we're... They're going to be awakened out of the earth. Somehow this is going to come to everlasting life. This is what they are longing for. Not everyone will inherit this everlasting life. Some to everlasting life. Others to shame and everlasting contempt. My sick plug again that I, non-shameful plug, is that we will talk about eternity in fall. So heaven, hell, and the end times, that will be our series for eight weeks in fall, FYI. So I won't go into it much now. Verse 13, just skipping ahead, it says this, As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Okay, so it's like, you're going to sleep, they're going to be awakened, there's something that's going to happen, stay the course, after you've, you've rested at the end of the days, you will arise. He's speaking to those yet that were not, like, pre-Jesus, Hang on, stay the course, you're going to get there. That's what it is. So that's Old Testament or Old Covenant. Then there's this resurrection of the dead, all that stuff goes on. Then we have the New Covenant. This is the Hebrews that he's speaking to today. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, this is what in the New Covenant, what they speak of for this resurrection. Brothers and sisters, we did not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Okay, you getting this picture together? According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Old covenant, new covenant. There's a death. There's a resurrection. There's the coming of a savior. There's at the, at the trumpet. These are the things that they're getting to. So the Hebrew author He's, he's trying to help them to realize there's this great delight that is happening that together, the old saints, Old Testament or Old Covenant, New Covenant saints, we experience something together and it comes because of Jesus, his death and resurrection. This is the middle part that joins both old and new together. Does that kind of make sense? So in light of all of this, we get to chapter 12 and we get to the word therefore. So right, so we all know therefore means you have to look back. So in light of everything in chapter 11, all the old covenant saints, Jesus, his death and resurrection, partnering us together, we get to therefore. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the one who designed it, and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Okay, this is a brilliant passage. But it doesn't make full sense unless we understand and we would have gone through chapter 11. But this is like we have these Old Testament saints. Most of them are pretty amazing. He's trying to say, listen, listen, the Old Testament saints are awesome. Hebrew speaking people, they are awesome. They stayed faithful or were faithful at the end, but don't put your hope in them. Like I know Moses is great. I know Abraham is great. Maybe like Cain and Abel aren't so great, but like these are great, but don't have your eyes fixed here. Have your eyes fixed on Jesus, he's the one who started this faith. He's the author of it, and he's the perfecter of it. He is the only way. Get your eyes on him. Consider him. And why should we consider him? So you don't grow weary and lose heart. 
That's why you consider him. This is the reason. Hang on, cling on to him. All about Jesus. This is where it begins. So this idea of running the race, this is one that Paul uses. That's why some people think that Paul might be the author of this book. But Paul uses this example of running the race or finishing the race or live your life in such a way. So there's this really brilliant story that I heard this last week as I was preparing. In 1980, how many of you have heard of the Boston Marathon? Okay, Boston Marathon, one of the most prestigious marathons. In 1980, there was a race that happened, like every race. And there was a lady whose name was Rosie Ruiz who won the marathon. She was a nobody. No one had ever heard of her before. It was her second marathon that she had ever run. And second that year, and she won the Boston Marathon. Everyone was shocked. Came out of nowhere. They're like, who is this lady? What happened? And she was a nobody who became famous really, really quickly. In the post-interview, which is hilarious, if you look up online, 1980 Boston Marathon winner interview or something like that, or Rosie interview, it's hysterical. And I should have probably showed it here, but just for time, I didn't. But they're doing this little interview, and the lady's like, well, how many, how many marathons have you run? Oh, it's my second one. It's like, oh, so like, what was your first time? Well, it was this amount of time. And her second time was like 35 minutes faster, which if you're a marathoner, that's a ridiculous increase on time. So she's like, oh, so like, did you do lots of, in or you must have done a lot of interval training. What's interval training? <laughs> it's like, uh, this is where you like, you run fast and you run slow and you do hills. Like you do all these different speeds to increase your time. She's like, yeah, I just like running. And so it's like, oh, so she's like Forrest Gump. So anyway, so she just, she wins this marathon and she gets all the accolades and all awards, but it seemed fishy, right? It's like, Something's off, like you made it through, but like it's weird. So they went back and looked at, they don't have cameras like we have today, looked at all the photos because they would take pictures of everyone going by certain stations. Never was there one photo of Rosie, not one. Where was Rosie? Where do they find her? She hopped onto a bus where there was no cameras. She took the bus around like 23 miles or whatever, got out where there was no cameras, premeditated, finished the race with ease as she rolls into first place and she becomes the winner of the Boston Marathon. She became very famous very quick and her fame changed into famous for something really bad. And this is how I sometimes think we try to run the race of faith in Christ. We're like, we're gonna go, we're gonna do this run, but we're looking for a shortcut. We don't, we don't want to do the long haul, the marathon, the endure, the fix your eyes on the prize, remove things that hinder, run the race. We often just like, what's the quick fix? How can I get in? How can I just do it without having these things that would require me to have to endure? But when we operate in our walk with God that way, one day we'll stand before him if we've cheaped out on it or faked our way through it. And we're going to get to Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Like that would be terrible, right? It's like Rosie wins, but she didn't actually win. She was a fraud and a fake. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons. In your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What do we hear in this passage? We are to know God, and we have to do the will of him who sent us, right? Do the will of the Father. Both of these things are necessary. If you just do obedience and the will of God, like what he, what he demands, expects, or commands in here to do, if you just do that, but you're not in relationship with him, it's a duty and it's law. If you just come and adore and worship him, but you don't do what he asks, it's also not there. Then you're, you're, you're not engaged then with what his heart is, which is that none would perish and all would come to know him. And so he requires that there's both. And this is why we have the Great Commission. This is some of the last words of Jesus to his followers. Matthew 28, then Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is at the heart of God. So, so in light of all this, we get to Hebrews 12. And we get here, and there's, I was, I was trying to think, how am I going to get through this passage? And where I want to land is, there's a bunch of commands that are written here in 
Hebrews 12. There's like 14 or 15 commands that are given. Now, if I could just convince you to follow them, that would be great. But like, it comes out of a relationship with him and I can't just convince you, but these aren't commands that are like dictator in heaven telling you what to do. These are commands that are principles of the kingdom of heaven. Like we want whatever is going on in heaven, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is how the earth becomes more like heaven. This is what makes society desirable. This is what's gonna bring transformation in the Fork Area area. This is how your life gets changed and society is different. These are principles that will impact society forever and when followed, the world changes. Who are the commands given to? The followers of Jesus. This is our responsibility. So I'm gonna read through and take us through quickly these 14 commands that are transformative. They bring you peace and joy in your life. They'll transform your families, your workplace, your home, your community. These are not just principles that are like nice ideas. These usher in the very heart and nature of God and bring them into the world. They're just beautiful. I wish I could convince you, but I'm gonna suggest that what you do when I go through these is that you open up your Bible or your phone and every time one of them comes up, you highlight it. And for the next week or two or three, open up these things and say, God, like, how do I live this out? If this is not something in your life, if this command that is there is not a part of your life and you're a follower of him, be like, God, like, how do I live this out? God, what do you say? What should change in my world? And engage the word of God with the Holy Spirit to bring about change because salvation is we're in relationship with him and then we do the will of the Father. And so this here is an opportunity for us to look at his word and do his will. Does that make sense? It's gonna make the world better. It's gonna make this church way better. It feels sometimes like it can't get much better, but it can get better and we're gonna get to them at the end. There's some commands that are written in here. Uh, they're not suggestions, they're, they're commands uh, that are gonna make this better, your personal life better, and us as a whole better. So, you ready to quickly walk through them? You got your pencils or pens or maybe your memory is great or you'll go back and just read Hebrews 12, that's fine. Verse one, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that entangles. This is the first two, although it's one. It's an action. It's not like a hope that everything that hinders you or your sin falls off of you. It's throw off. This is an intentional thing that we do. We take it and we send it, the sin that is there, a slave to righteousness, it's taking these things. And it's not just sin, it's anything that would hinder you from pursuing God. Okay, so it's like, the sin is, it's easy to recognize most sin, right? And I, I, I've had to struggle with this one. I'm like, God, is there a sin in my life that I kind of like, I guess this is just how I'll be forever, right? Do you have that? It's like, I guess I'll always struggle with this sin. He's saying, no, no, hang on a second. Throw off everything that hinders you, the sin that entangles you. You have a job to get rid of it. And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit. We're running a race. We're not cheating the system. We're not like hopping on a bus, but we're, we're, we're going all the way through and saying, this is a command. Throw off everything that hinders you. This morning, this is what I spent time doing. I'm like, God, the sin part I, I can get. And I'm, I work on this area all the time because I want to walk righteously. But what hinders me? And we live in a society that has so many distractions for us, right? What hinders me from the path of pursuing the kingdom? Spent time this morning, my God, I need this to be dealt with in my life. Would you show me these things? I have some work to do this weekend. I mean this week, I have some work because I want nothing to hinder and I know there's things right now that hinder. Command number two, fix your eyes on Jesus in verse two. Fix your eyes on him. What does it mean to fix your eyes on something? intently gaze, put it, lock and load it, nothing else distracted, like blinders. Is that awkward now? Just keeping my eyes just fixed and I'm just gonna hold it there. Fix your eyes on him. This is not just show up on occasion to church and you sort of randomly hope that you kind of have your eyes on him for a moment. It's the way you live your life is you have your eyes fixed. Jesus, what do you see? What is going on? How do I live this out? Fix your eyes on him. Verse three, consider Jesus. So fix your eyes on him and then consider is like, what does he think? 
What does he feel? How, what would he do? The old bracelet, what would Jesus do? Remember that? Like, what would Jesus do? And you're like, what would you do, Jesus? How does this work? But to consider, to ponder, to walk with, this is, means that Jesus is engaged in every area of your life all of the time. This is what he's asking us to do. Now, if you're like me, I'm like evaluating going, oh, it's not always like that for me. And I desire to be, but it's not always there. My finances, my time, my holidays, my sleep, when I wake up, everything, consider Christ in it all. Does that make sense? Consider who? I like it, I like it. Okay, verse four. In your struggle against sin, have you resisted to the point of shedding blood? Right, so Jesus didn't sin. He's dying. He has this call from God to do the will of the Father. If you can find any other way, would you take this from me? He was so overwhelmed and stressed that the capillaries burst in his skin and he actually bled. The stress, blood came out of him. And as blood has come, that's how it's like, have you, in your struggle against sin, have you resisted to the point of that where you pleaded with him? Become so serious about dealing with your sin. And I'm like, oh man, I, I accept it as someone who just fails and struggles. I'm like, God, I just accept sin. He's like, no, 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 become a slave to righteousness. Don't, don't, don't struggle and then like just give up. Struggle to the point of shedding blood is what the author is writing. Verse seven, endure hardship as discipline. It doesn't say all hardship is from God. Therefore, God is disciplining you. No, no. Endure hardship, any hardship you have, endure it as discipline. God disciplines the ones he loves. It's like spoken of here like 10 times in six verses, the word discipline. But it's like, it's like, can God, can he rescue you from any hardship that you're in? Yes or no? Any hardship, can he rescue you? Does he rescue you from every hardship? No, but he could. So he's saying, endure hardship, knowing, it's not like he gives it, knowing that the hardship will be hard, right? Endure it as if the Lord is disciplining you, molding you, growing your character, developing you, walking with you through it. He could at any point rescue you, but if he doesn't, endure the hardship as discipline from the Lord or as a way in which a good father is leading you to maturity and character and knowing this is full trust in him. Do you get that? So often it's like there's hardship and we just curse God. Like, God, if you love me, why don't you? Command in Jesus' name. He's like, no, no, actually endure it. Don't hop on the bus. Don't escape it. He can provide a way for you to run faster on the race, but don't skip out on it. Endure hardship as discipline. He'll grow your character. You'll learn to trust him. Okay, the sixth one is in verse nine. Submit to the Father of spirits and live. How many of you want more peace in your life? Okay, so 12. How many of you want more chaos in your life? There's always a smart Alec. Yeah, thank you. I love it. I saw that hand back there. <laughs> is that my guy? I can't wait to see. Jackson. Jackson, I love it. Uh, you want peace in your life. How does one do that? Submit to the Father. Submit to the Spirit, the Father of Spirits, and live. And then it tells you that peace is one of the things that we are granted. And again, you might not trust him, but if you know him, you can actually believe that his word is true. You want peace? Actually submit yourself then. Verse 12, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. I like that. Um, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. This is an action. How do you get stronger muscles? Jesus. Uh, you work out. <laughs> right? You work out. You, you do something. Now, we're looking at this saying, knees, that's not really a muscle. Your feeble arms, perhaps that's there. But you work it out. It's like, no, 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 like, you can strengthen yourself. Do things that make you stronger in faith. Don't hop on the bus. Push through. Endure. Take nutrients. Keep on going. Do the hard stuff. Hardship comes. Grow. Take it as discipline so that you will be strong in character. You'll be ready for anything, the author of James says. Verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Doesn't say Make every effort if the other person does. It doesn't say like fake it or most people. 
Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Doesn't mean that you're best friends, but to be at peace with everyone. Be holy, verse 14. How in the world does someone get holy? How does someone get holy? It's the only way. So it's like, be holy. The only way you can be holy is actually to be able to stand before God and his blood covers you, to be a follower of him. Stay connected. Be holy. Have his blood cover you. Be holy. Don't cheat on the bus. And now we move to these commands on how we are to treat each other here in the body of Christ. Verse 15. Listen to this. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Or like you see Rosie... Or we'll use Joel. That's a better example today. You see Joel cheating. He's like, I can't ride the bus anymore. And he sneaks off. And he, I mean, he can't run the race anymore. He sneaks off and get on the bus. Our job is don't let him fall short of the glory of God. What do you do? You drag him off the bus. You, bah, one shot. No, you're not. Don't let him fall from the grace of God. This is one of our responsibilities as the body of Christ. We are like relentless to ensure that people aren't losing the grace of God. That people aren't choosing just to walk away with, without like a fight. To like, no, no, like we, we want you. We want to come in here. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. And maybe there's people that are faking it. We're like, no, no, please don't fake. We really need to know him. Goes on to say, don't let a bitter root grow up to cause trouble and defile many. If you have a bitter root, what do you do? You gotta get rid of it. How do you rip that thing out to obey God? Verse 16, listen to this one. See that no one is sexually immoral and godless. We are in a very godless and sexually immoral society. Yes or no? Yes, Jesus. How in the world, <laughs> how in the world do we help deal with this? How do we walk this through? And God is saying through his servant here in the book of Hebrews, it's like a message to the church. It's like, see to it that no one is sexually immoral. It's not people who are not followers. Those who are followers, and sure they're not sexually immoral. It's like, oh man, now we have to be open. We have to know each other. We have to help. We have to desire for purity. And we're like trying to take people and say, no, no, let's walk together. You can make it through. Wait. And yet society is like, no, 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 no. Indulge in everything. He's like, no, no, no. Together, let's help each other be sexually pure and godly, not godless. Right? This is our responsibility and great delight. This is not judgment. This is a passion of love that we have for people that they would know God so they can have peace in their life. This is the great delight that we have as the body of Christ. Does that make sense? And then we get to verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire. We're talking this side. To darkness, gloom, and storm. To a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Okay, this is the old covenant in the old days. Why is this the case? It's not because God is more wrathful. He's a perfect God. He is perfect in every way, which means imperfect can't come into the presence of a perfect God. So he made a way and the answer was Jesus so that we could actually come into his throne room and be with him because when we stand before him now, his blood covers us and we can go there now. So look what it says in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, Man, this is a good verse. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is what we have the great joy and glory. This is the hope. This is the answer. This is like everything that God designed throughout all of creation. He made a way not to be around the mountain where we fear and tremble because the sacrifice wasn't enough of animals. But he's like, I will die and I will be sacrificed on your behalf. I will go through tears and sweating blood to be obedient to the will of my Father so that you can have joy and peace and you can enter right into the Holy of Holies. And it's an invitation and a gift for us. 
And then verse 25, do not refuse him who speaks, God himself. Obviously, if he made a way that we could enter and we could come right with him, what the Old Testament saints would have died for and did, then we get here and we have access. He's like, now that you're here, now that you have access here, don't refuse my voice. Listen to me. Do my will. Like, you're with me now. Do my will. Walk with me. Love me. Like, do my will. Let's walk this together. His voice at the time of his death shook the earth, tore the temple curtain from top to bottom. And look what it says in verse 26. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. So in the final end, so he shook things here once, earthquake, made a way, demonstrated he's God, tore the curtain so that we can come have access. One more time, he will shake it. That's when he comes again, the trumpet, like we said in 1 Thessalonians. He's gonna come and it's gonna shake and everything that is wood, hay, and stubble will be burnt away. Only things that are precious, that are eternal, will last forever. This is the invitation and this is why we can trust him because it says this in verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. That's the best. We go through this thing. He was a consuming fire in the Old Testament, yeah? They just didn't have Jesus. He was a consuming fire. Anything got near needed to be stoned or would be burnt up and wouldn't make it. He provides a way through. (sighs) Provides a way through so that we can now enter his throne room. We can come before him. And our response as we listen to him and obey him, our response is in worship, in awe and reverence with our eyes on him, fixed on him, consider him, walk with him, help each other to remain pure and righteous and come before him. This is the great invitation that we have. But how often do we allow ourselves to have things that hinder us that are even good that hinder us from the purpose that God would have us for? I don't mean... You go and stop working your job. or No, I don't mean like that. I don't mean those things to hinder where you just now go and hum in, the, in, in a far off mountain and hope that God is near you. No, no. In every part of your day, you consider Christ. You have your eyes fixed on him. You're like, God, what do you have for me? And if he would redirect your path, you follow, you go. And this is what's going to make Fort Gary great. It's going to transform the city that we live in. It's going to be instrumental in our country. This is the good news and the hope that we have. And our only response out of everything that Jesus did is one, and that is we worship him with awe and reverence. Amen? Amen. This is our joy and our delight. Is God the best? (laughs) Does he love you? Yeah. Did he die for you? Does he want relationship with you? Yeah, these are true. This is, this is true. This is the whole point of Hebrews. Does he want to make you unshakable? The only way to be unshakable is if we're part of something that is going to last forever. We need eternal life. And he invites us into the, this relationship and says, let's together fulfill the will of my Father. And this is our great invitation. So the worship team will come up and we're just going to end in worshiping him. But I want to invite, as they come up, I'd like to invite you to stand if you wouldn't mind. And I think it would just be appropriate for us. Why don't we thank him? Why don't we just, before we, before we sing, they can play alongside us, but why don't, we, why don't we just take a few minutes out loud, in unison together, let's worship him, let's thank him, let's praise him. There's so many things. In light of the passage that we just read, we have much to praise him for, Right? And let's, let's do that together. So let's, let's bow our heads and together in unison, let's begin to thank him and then we'll close with a song of worship.